Rick. Antoine. <laughs> How are you? I don't know. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Look, a motorcycle. That was an acid bike. How you doing, pal? I'm doing well. This is, you know, day whatever of, of quarantine. <laughs> quarantine? Quarantine or, or stay-at-home order, I should say. I'm not quarantine Man, I don't so know much. what's going on. I know. All I know is I have one disposable mask since it began. <laughs> like, if I want to spread the plague, I'll just let, you know, I'll just send it to someone's house, you know? <laughs> Here, open this. Right? Well, well, maybe Bugatti should have some branded masks. I think that's going to be the next hot, hot swag item. I just see that Joe dialed in from uh, the clothing. I think he's got some. Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be the next hot, like I said, swag item myself. So uh, okay, well we could sterilize them, you know. Yeah, I mean they make the the reusable ones. I've I've gotten I've ordered a few that they've yet to come. Mm -hmm. They're they're in high demand, so we'll we'll see. Uh, well, in the meantime, you you use your mask and you burn it, right? <laughs> uh. So, so what have you been up to since all of this craziness that started back in March? Let me tell you, I, <clears throat> I started with the company in September and I was 17 trips into it because I looked around, and I said, wow. I mean, I, I had left the industry in May and I, I was getting phone calls from different reps around the country, different manufacturers. Hey, where are you? I'm like, where am I? I? I don't know. Why? Have you seen this Bugatti lighter? I mean, people were screaming at me. No, no, no. And, you know, and, and they're looking for a national person. You're perfect. You got to get in there. You, you got to see this thing. And I'm like, ah, like I was really, you know, psychologically and emotionally like I'm, you know, done. Uh, I saw the lighter and I'm like, oh, my God, I'll be kicking myself if I'm not involved with this mm -hmm. so to answer your question you know what have i been doing i'm without a plane ticket i'm i'm like ah <laughs> you know i know it's that that's that's the whole industry it's all about traveling and getting out there in front of people and shaking hands and kissing some babies and yet here we are <laughs> i know i know i would always say my motto was a face-to-face -face is worth a thousand tweets you know, yes. you got to just show up, you know, and that's all I really know since 97, you know, just set a schedule, book the flights, just keep, oh, hey, look. That was my train. <laughs> Antoine, you made me miss my fucking train. That's going to Boston. I could go see LJ Peretti. Um. I'm just starting to see people on the trains. I got the track right right here that is the Acela Express, which is the like the high speed, which mm -hmm. they stopped eight weeks ago. And apparently they're gonna kick it back in to service in a couple weeks. That was the regional and then there's the local. So you got me on the Connecticut shoreline over here. It's like a ghost town. So what I wanted to do with you and deep cuts is, is kind of dive in deep. I know for me, I'm used to working with magazines and I still do the magazine stuff, but you know, with a magazine article, you can only go so, so deep mm -hmm. with each person, depending on what magazine is for and right. what the audience is. If it's a trade magazine, then it's usually all business talk. Right. And if it's a consumer magazine, then it's a lot of leisure stuff and you try to leave all the business kind of shop talk and kind of out of it, not to bore people. So right. For me, Deep Cuts is like a middle ground because there's a little bit of everything. Because we yeah. have manufacturers, we have uh, consumers watching, you know, a little bit of everything. So I, how I figure is like we all work, you know, we all have our jobs. And mm -hmm. for us, I mean, I think you can learn from so many different people in the industry, especially, um, especially people like you who've had so much experience and different working with different companies, working with different products. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do is kind of dive into like your story and then kind of lead up into like where you are now and what, you know, Bugatti is all about. And okay. then hopefully when all this is 
as we're starting to see with the states when they start to reopen and we can start getting back to some form of normalcy then people yeah. when they see your products in the store yeah. they have a, a nice story and this kind of memory of our conversation to kind of pull back on sounds like marketing man i love it <laughs> so I, I guess a good place to start will be the beginning when did you first get into the industry um i uh i got a phone call one night from a buddy i just moved from new york city to connecticut and the buddy said to me hey i'm importing humidors from thailand this was 1996. i'm importing humidors from thailand you want to help me sell these things and market them and i'm like you know i'm kind of busy i go what the hell's a humidor he goes <laughs> come over to my house I went over to his house. I got one of those quick tutorials on Spanish cedar and hygrometers and, you know, humidification systems, a nice seal and, you know, and I, I was pretty excited, you know, because I, you know, I'd smoke cigars casually here and there, but never to that level where I got to maintain these things, you know, right. so anyway, I, I had six different models. I went to, I believe Walmart. The next day, I bought one of those little carts with a bungee cord, right? I had the six models stacked on the carts. Um, I jumped on that train that you just saw go by. Of course, it was going the other way towards New York. That one's going to Boston. And I had the page literally, I mean, this is like the dark ages, the 90s, right? I had the yellow pages. The only one with an ad was Jonathan Drew Incorporated, the <laughs> back of this of the World Trade Center. I'm like, I start there and then I'll work my way north. I had, you know, some other ones in Manhattan to see. And then I knew I had to be back to open one of the restaurants at four. So I get down there, hot July, traipsing around. And now I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get pretty agitated because I can't find the store, but I keep passing a little cart. So I finally stop at this little cigar cart and I go, do you know where Jonathan Drew Incorporated? It was Jonathan. He goes, that's me. I go, oh, I go, uh, he's like, wait, you don't like the car, dude? I mean, I go, listen, I'm in business 10 minutes. You know, I, you want to see what I got? That's, that's how it started, you know? And then Jonathan, you know, just hit me with his passion. It was passion against passion, you know? He and I were both like, you know, you know, turn up the volume and blah, 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 instantly. Like we were, you know, friends forever. And, um, <clears throat> Listen, I'm, I've got cigars that I'm making um, in Lower Manhattan. It was a three-story walk-up, uh, La Rosa factory, making the, the early, early La Vieja Havana from the 90s. Um, he goes, can you take these around and show them around? I go, I don't know how much I'm going to be getting around. But, you know, either way, it became an obsession. I just started stopping in store after store. I work concentrically from Connecticut, a little New York, hop on the ferry down to Long Island, up to New England. And um, that was it. And then it was, I reached that point of no return. I became a, a partner in 2001 at Drew. And there was no turning back. I was, I was all in. And it's a hard industry to leave. You know, I've, I've left a couple times. And... Um, you know, at this point in my life, you know, I'm 50, I just turned 58, you know, so I'm like, the only work really is the sciatica <laughs> and the back hurts, you know, I got sinusitis, all that. I, I go, other than that, it's, I couldn't think of anything else I'd want to do. You know, you just show up at these shops. I've told people over the years, I said, you know, what I love about the industry is, and, and what keeps me pulled in into the inside the membrane, right? And when I puncture the membrane and escape, I gotta find my way back in, you know? Um, is I could be blindfolded and eardropped into any store in, in the US and just kind of like there's a commonality, you know? Like they pull the blindfold off and I'm, and I'm home, you know? Um, it's it's infectious, you know. I re I recall uh, reading an article. It was back in the '90s uh, that uh, you know, with with um, suburbanization and whatnot, and the America's obsession with mine, you know, like block everything out. The front porch becomes a back deck, 
you know, video. And, you know, and that was years ago. And look at how many more things we've added to basically, which we have to do now by compliance is kind of isolate a bit. But, you know, this article was about, and it was interesting to me, you know, the, the social animal aspect of, you know, humankind mm -hmm. and how cigars are that way that people can just kind of have an excuse to huddle together and blow smoke around and talk about their blend and talk about this, that, and the other. Um, there's no gaps in the conversation because if nobody has anything to say, well, then you take a pull off your cigar, you know, and it's like this rhythm, you know, and I've also gotten pretty deep into uh, the metaphysical arts, in particular over the last few years, and smoke in general, the ethereal nature of smoke draws humans. We just love this, this, the way it just is free and blows around. Um, it's what I'm drawn to. Even vapes. I even sneak a vape here and there. I see you do a little bit of everything. Nicotine, caffeine, ice cream. <laughs> so when, so working at, at Drew State, it seems like that's, that served as like the breeding ground for a lot of creative people in the industry. Now, yeah. a lot of people, you can kind of trace their career back to Drew Estate at some point, that they passed through at some point or they worked there. So, so I mean, what was that environment like, the, the Drew Estate environment, especially in those early days? Well, I mean, I wear a lot of jewelry right now, you know, and I have since I, I was there, but my main piece of jewelry, like everyone else, was uh, you were issued an outpatient bracelet, <laughs> so, you know? Uh, it, it was entropy, you know, entropy, you know, and physics. I mean, just chaos, but it was like this organized chaos. You just stirred it up. Um, we, we hit the market with a very uh, untraditional, uh, you know, brand. You know, the first brand that hit, the Acid brand. Um, I mean, not a lot of people uh, would have taken money on the bet that we were making it. You know, it was like, come on, are you guys serious with this thing? Really? <laughs> I mean, I had interventions from other, you know, manufacturers that said, you know, you seem like a nice guy. Maybe, you know, maybe you come work for me, you know, to, to my parents going, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> yeah. But what I was recognizing with that brand is, you know, if I just, I glued myself to, to the, to the street. And it was thousands of stores. I mean, I hit the, I, I hit, I broke like 2000 stores by 03. And that was without repeats. And that was, you know, I had the stacks of the cards, you know, just keep showing up, you know, um, and make it lively, make it entertaining. Um, you know, I've always really kind of recognized that aspect of this industry is, you know, not a great percentage of it is the filler, the binder, and the wrapper, and the fermentation, and the da, 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 da. I mean, I know for myself, if it, if it tastes, I know a cigar is good if, before I know it, I'm halfway through it. But during that uh, adventure right there, it's a lot of conversation. It's a lot of connecting. Again, it's that ethereal nature of smoke, this calming, spiritual kind of quality, you know, that just sort of unites things. I don't know if I just answered a question there or no. <laughs> you answered a, a question. I think you got pretty close. So, <laughs> was I skirting a question? No, I never no. did that. <laughs> well, so to kind of backtrack a little bit. So you started in the industry during the '90s, which is you know the big cigar boom that everybody talks about. Right. The time where where you couldn't. As a manufacturer, I mean, you couldn't even keep up with the demand of the cigars going out and all that kind of stuff. I right. mean, that was that must have been a very different time in the industry compared to like now, where you have. Well, I'm gonna take a cattle prod to you right now. You're gonna go what? <laughs> I think a big reason for our success was we launched like our significant launch. You know, we we were dabbling in it 
um, prior to me, actually 96 was John's first show, mm -hmm. uh, Drew. Um, then 97, 98 was my first show, pre-acid. 99, by 99, dude, the boom was over. There were vultures flying over, over the, you know, um, Vegas, man, just like buying people out. And that was another reason why people were scratching their heads. Like, we're in, this industry's in ruins. And who are these guys? And you know, with all these motorcycles. You know, so I think what really uh, a big reason for the success of the company was we didn't come in. We came in having to do, just be good at everything, you know, customer service. We had to go above and beyond with all these other kinds of things. Whereas, you know, there's a lot of companies you could look at in the 90s that, you know, all they had to do was open their doors and you know you was just keep up you got to keep up with demand um one of the articles from like 98 um in aficionado and when, when i'm you know like oh let me like uh, read my industry magazine here <laughs> and it was an article i won't say who it is even though you know what he's the one who made the comment it was in the book oh so the, the standard question for how long do you age your cigars you know and this fella said uh my cigars age in the ups truck <laughs> you know? It's like, in other words, just get them out there and they're going to sell. Um, but fortunately for us, it was not like that. You know, we had to claw and, and just pound it out to, 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 to get a market. The market, I don't think, started really picking up until like the rebound, I guess, was like 02, 03. It was, and it was a kind of a slow comeback, you know? So do you, do you see the so when you look at the industry as it is now, do you see any any patterns kind of repeating themselves? Like is the you know our our cigars still in, or do you think we're in a kind of downward slope? I mean, what do you kind of see? No, no. You know what? There's um, more and more people like entry level. Uh, you know, it's like that that one out of ten that show up in a cigar shop. Um, you'll see groups and whatnot or whatever will be bitten by the bug, you know, and then there's no turning back, you know, cause they, they see it. They don't just see and taste the smoke, the cigar. Um, they just don't begin with their favorite cigar. It's the whole thing kind of enraptures them a bit, you know, like, Hmm, this is interesting. You know, it's like a, a nice little clubby kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, again, very social. Um, there's an awful lot of brands. I mean, it's such a buyer's market right now. There's so, there's such an, an abundance of brands out there. Um, that it's just, it's like a perfect time to start smoking cigars or getting more and more interested with, uh, with cigars, you know? I mean, it's just like, wow. Um, the flavors are amazing. Amazing. So you said it's a it's a buyer's market. So what about the other side of it, the selling part? You know, how do you very how can tough. You, very tough. I was about to say, how, yeah, because how do you compete with, like you said, so many brands? Like you walk into a humor right now, and it's like so many, so many brands, so many, you know, especially this time of year. Usually, um, yeah, I don't yeah. know if it's this year we'll get it, but usually, like this year, like this time of year, May, June, you're inundated with like all the press releases about new big releases yeah. coming out for the. Yeah. You know, they're going to debut at, at IPs VR. And right. now it's just like, I mean, it's just like so much is out there. So it's yeah. almost like, how do you, how do you, if you do have a brand, like how do you sell it at this point? What's the selling point? And well, and you know what, J just to get into a humidor is hard enough. Mm -hmm. um, but 10 times harder than that is the terms. Um, you know, I, I, I've gotten a lot of calls the last few years from people starting brands or whatnot, and I tell everyone kind of the same thing. Put that thing on your back and w work concentrically. Know that anybody that you are approaching to put your brand in there, know that w within like a three, four hour drive, you yourself could be there, you know? And then once you get that 
uh, to catch a little bit and break, um, branch out a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Yeah, I guess what it comes down to the way the industry is the last few years is you can't, you can't be missing anything. You know, your packaging, your story, the blends, the consistency of the blends. Uh, it, it just has to be laser sharp because again, there's so many alternatives, you know? Yeah. Well, how important is that story to your, to your brand? Cause I know that we, um, I will say there are some brands that I see now that they just put the, all the emphasis on the, is on the product. They think mm -hmm. the product's going to sell itself. And then yeah. there's other brands that they put somebody up, you know, up front or something like that, yeah. a family yeah. or individual. This yeah. is my brand. This is my passion. Which, which kind of option works best? That's a tough question for crying out loud. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the more it's all a, a reflection of the manufacturer themselves, the more the phenomenology of selling it converts into recommending, you know, um, it's like the chef in the kitchen with sticking the ladle under your, under your, you know, hey, try this, you know, or mm -hmm. dip a little bread in this sauce, you know, um, I guess, you know, the further away you move from actually being the hands-on creator, the more challenging, challenging it is to really kind of convey the, um, the excitement, the enthusiasm about what you're, you're selling. Um, but it certainly can be done, you know? And there's a lot of companies that are really tapped into the push button imagery and whatnot. And the product's good. You know, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of good product. Um, and then, of course, you know, social media is such a big thing. I fought it for the longest time. I'm still, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is like, oh, no. <laughs> you're on top, I'm on bottom. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> uh, like, what if I go like this? Oh, you're sideways. <laughs> I'm going to have to take a Dramamine. I just got dizzy doing that. Um, you know, again, it's, you got to really be clicking on all cylinders and you got to really love mixing it up, you know, being out there and, and um, you know, in and out of the airports, in and out of cars and, 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 and really just hammering the streets, you know? And, and when it comes to like selling a product, like, do you, and you're talking about like traveling and like hitting the streets and, and getting out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the, what's the approach? Cause I know that for people who maybe not, it's not even a cigar product, maybe they're getting into some other industry and they're oh, trying yeah. to grow, grow their product. You know, do yeah. they start locally? Do they conquer that local market or do they think? Yeah. Broadly? Yeah. Again, you want that, you want that connectivity, that very easy, quick connectivity to, you know, the people you're approaching um, you know, you want, you want to have nothing trumps enthusiasm. So if you're really excited about what you got, what you're doing, you know, I, I got, I, I sort of trained myself. Um, you know, I've always looked at the, the retail door, right. We pull into the parking lot, you know, typical me out there, right. Sitting next to the rep. I'm always the dummy, dummy in the passenger seat. And, and you know, look at that door that I'm going to walk through <clears throat> and that's the stage to me. It's like, as soon as I break the plane of the door, it's curtain, curtain up, you know, and just be on, you know, and listen. And, um, it's, it's the stage, you know, just give, give as much as you can have it come from deep, you know, and, um, that for me, that that approach, um, because I, I do have a, <clears throat> a, a stage history, stand up and improv and, and that sort of thing. And so I think for me, it's always been my creative outlet. You know, I'm like, you know what, I'll do this. This is cool. And uh, so that's just kind of how I've always approached it. Um, but that, that's that's where the, that's where things really happen when you're in their store. You know, so when you're selling something, you just said your background. I mean, what's the most important skill set to have or that you should work on if you're in the selling business? Like, is it to your delivery of something? Like you said, 
Is it how you, uh, you know, hype up something? Um, <clears throat> again, it's, it, you've, I, I think you really have to be authentic. I think the more what you're selling, like I've made it clear to people, I'm a shitty salesperson, but I'm a deadly recommender. Deadly. You know, like you're not saying no, right? Um, but I have to really, I have to really feel it, you know, what I'm doing. And, um, and like I said, nothing trumps that enthusiasm. And then it's just that discipline to know, to turn yourself on, you know, when it's time to, to get it done, to get your product in a store. Uh, and then, you know, then it's all that follow up, follow through, sale through, um, cultivating, um, no shortcut. There's no shortcut to it. If you want to do it right, you know, like the current, um, you know, Bugatti thing, um, you know, I made it clear to the company out of the gates. I said, you know, if I'm not really into selling, selling, I'm more of a brander, more of a go to the right people. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the, you know, the phenomenology of, of, of the the right people, brick and mortar, namely hardcore cigar smoker, purchasing one of these lighters, um, the power in that and how it's going to spread, how it's going to lay a foundation for sales down the road, you can't equal it. Like one one sale to the right maven in a store is worth like fifty lighters on a website. You know, it's just that powerful. So. And somebody watching today says, uh, they say you have a story about Starbucks. Is that true? Do you know what they're talking about? I have no clue. Is there a Starbucks in the area? <laughs> um, you know, it's one of my, uh, it's, it always works too. Like if, um, I figured this out years ago. If you're ever put on the spot in a store, you know, like, hey, you know, you guys backwarded me. What's going on with these backward? Bah, 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 bah. They're hitting you with this, that, and the other. And you just go, is there Starbucks in the area? And they go like <laughs> this. Uh, we, we have coffee. Or they'll go, well, there's a Joe's t uh, um, coffee shop right next door. They're actually really good. Or, yeah, there's a Starbucks across the street, idiot. You didn't see it when you pulled in. The important <laughs> thing is they never go back to the negativity. So... <laughs> The, the power behind Starbucks logo just overtakes their orbit and it reboots every situation. You so could I use think it. We, I think we all learned something today, man. We know how to deflect. That's so important. Switch and bait <laughs> the Starbucks trick. That's it. Throw them under the, uh, under the bus. They can, they could take it. So yeah. now, like, and, you, and you've been talking about it throughout this interview, but Bugatti, like what, for those people who don't know what it is or aren't familiar with it, what is what is Bugatti about? What kind of products do you all sell? What's that all about? Uh, what I love is it's just the Mirage, the Vulcan lighters, and butane, the 99.99999% refined butane. <clears throat> it was designed, these lighters were designed by one of the gentlemen responsible for actually bringing torch technology into the cigar industry. It was previously, it was invented, uh, torch technology was invented in dentistry in the 80s. In the 90s, it was this guy and a couple of other engineers that said, you know what, we got something here. And um, so I make that clear to people um, when I get all intense in their store, I'm like, this wasn't just some schmo that said, you know what, let me try my lighter. I'm going to take a stab at doing a lighter, you know, and I'll sell that, you know, put a fancy name on it. You can only imagine the intellectual perspective, the point of reference that this person had when he walked into this project a few years ago and said, okay, how do I improve upon this technology that I'm pretty responsible for bringing into this industry? Um, you know, the first thing to, uh, to go out on you, to become problematic on a lighter is the, uh, is the burner. Well, we'll make, we'll make it replaceable, right? So we got that out of the way. But even bigger than that um, is everything to do with the, f with the fuel, the butane, the, oh man, you know, like every, every store knows it, where they've got the guy 
for the third time walking up to the counter with the sheepish look. You're like, you know, I know you already broke it, but it's still not really, can you look at it? You know, there's all, all these issues with air pockets and bubbles and, you know, um, the, the fuel source, you know. Um, this here, you, you take one of these 18 milliliter cans of butane right up into the lighter. If you look into the lighter, there's a direct connection to the burner. So there's no, there's no ear pockets. Which is nice. <laughs> it's just a direct connect. Not to mention it's 18 milliliters. So your typical tank on a typical torch flame lighter, regardless of brand is anywhere from 1.8 to two and a half milliliters. This is 18 milliliters. It lasts forever. Um, plus, why are people texting me? Um, uh, not to mention that, that the, the valve stem is universal. So, you, you know, you could pull it out of your lighter that your buddy's sitting next to you with his Calibri or Zyker or whatever. Oh, man, I'm out of fuel. Uh, listen, don't go bothering Ted, man. He's, he's having a rough day up there. Here. You unscrew the bottom of your Vulcan, you pull out your can, here you go. He fills his lighter, you take it back, put it back in your lighter, and you're both good to go. Um, the butane is just, it was just so ingenious. Again, when, 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 um, when they flew in to see me, I was at the time in Atlanta, um, I looked at this thing, I'm like, there's no way. Like, I gotta I got be involved in this. It's just that incredible. You know, it's such a game changer. Yeah, I mean, just from what you described, like you said, the there's so many issues with lighters. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the sometimes the prettiest lighters, like the most pain in the butt, just to keep <laughs> just to keep operating like you need it to, and it's just like so it, it breaks your heart sometimes. Like I like know the most I... nice looking lighter, and it's just so complicated. So what I'm you like described, every... though, it takes half the complications like out of it. Yeah, right, right. It at least gives you that what well, you know the chance to address whatever. I mean, right down to, if you look at the little regulator switch, there's an Allen wrench that fits in there to re-tighten the this, this spring, you know, for, um, to adjust the flame. Um, I tell people it's, it's like, you know, have your other lighters. I mean, I love my lighters as well, even the broken ones. You can't throw them away because they're like heavy metal. I'm like, what do I do? Throw this in the garbage or just go in the recyclables? So it goes in the bottom of a drawer, you know? Um, but th this is the lighter that you, that you own to just be your series. It's like the car in your garage, you know? You got the parts for it if you need, need parts. And, you know, it's just a serious machine. It's like having um, heavy equipment in your pocket, you know? So, like, when you educate the retailers about your product and you get them in there, I think the, the key is how do you then educate the consumers about the product so that they it's not just sitting there on the shelf collecting dust oh so yeah how, yeah so how is your approach about educating all the you know from the like i said the retail side down to the consumer like how do you deliver your message to the consumers to well to that that that's when when i first saw this one and and i don't know if this will make sense you know uh but th this is the type of product the, the type of technology that the sizzle right? The uniqueness uh, could, if you let it, get in the way of the ultimate success of where this thing can go. Why? The, the novelty, because I've presented it many, again, I, I had a lot of trips. I, I mean, a lot of visits from September till th this whole virus thing. And um, people are like, you know, eight out of 10 times, they're sold instantly. And then you notice that they're not listening. Like, no, 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 let me tell you what it, uh, no, no, I get it, look at this. And people are, you know, coming over from the lounge because they notice that the, the shop owner or the manager is all excited. Next thing you know, you got a little crowd, you take an opening order, plus you add the five or six lighters that you sold, you know, oh, well, order, I want an extra two purple and one blue and, and Ralph wants a black, you know? Um, so I have to keep slowing it down and letting them know, listen, you know, this is bigger than even just this sizzle.
you know? So it, it's this ongoing pounding of information and reiteration um, of what the lighter is all about. Um, the butane, how the butane, you know, I, I tell stores that, that if we're doing our jobs right, eight out of 10 of these little cans of butane will never see the inside of a lighter. Just put them right at the counter, it's pocket fuel. You can fill mm -hmm. eight to 10 lighters with, with, with this little can of butane. The days are over of being out of butane or stuffing a 300 milliliter can in your pocket or your golf bag or as TSA you're gonna find it. You know, th this is this little miniature can of butane that goes a long way. Wow. When, you know, you're talking about like how you have to sell this through visiting people and trips. Mm -hmm. And yet we're in a time now where, you know, traveling is a little bit of a, uh, I would say a challenge. Um, yeah for all of us yeah so how are you kind of adapting your your marketing and your kind of well i'm gonna add an hour to our conversation so <laughs> we're gonna be on until six is that cool <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> even if i have to go to the bathroom um <laughs> you know what thankfully thankfully i um there was a lot of one-on-one -on -one. I, you know, I, I make a point of going to what I call the market makers. So when you hit certain territories, you go to those market makers. You go to where you know you're going to improve your chances that that, you know, a lot of these guys I've known for many, many years, you know, and who instantly get it, get behind it. And so we made a lot of headway as far as like paving it that way. Um, aside from that, just more of this, you know, um, uh, Joe uh, Genovese is our, our marketing guy. And I mean, the pictures, the way he captures the pictures, the schematics, whereas, you know, it's just a one, one view you could see kind of like, wow, what, what's this, this, this thing is doing, you know, uh, you got the lighter and you got the can sticking out of the lighter and the, the, the burner off and, um, I think people are assimilating it, you know, but just as soon as I can, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the streets again. Um, it'll probably be, you know, New England and then New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, anything I could do by car. Because again, I only got that one mask I was telling you. <laughs> you got to get more masks. This thing is filthy too. It's like, a, you know. It's got Go to Groupon. Groupon has, has all these masks. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. All right. <laughs> Actually, somebody who just dialed in here said they were sending me some, and they didn't. So, somebody asked, are these um, Bugatti lighters, are they in, what kind of stores are they in? So, are they in convenience stores, are they in DTOs, or just premium stores? Um, for the most part, I'd say about 90% premium stores. Um, you know, uh, that's kind of where we're driving it. We're driving it through... Um, your local cigar shop, you know, um, but to some degree we are in B and I believe C, some C, C stores. Um, again, people, uh, we get, we do get a lot of calls, a lot of interest. Um, <clears throat> in fact, you know, we are, the lighters are available online direct uh, retail um, until this thing loosens up a little bit and we can get back out there and stores start opening, you know, in, in a more full service manner. You know, a lot of these stores that are open, it's just curbside. And, right. and I've called around to a lot of my accounts and I'm like, Rick, we're not selling any, no lighters, no cut, nothing. You know, this is like running cigars out to the curb. So, you know what, we're, we're, we're gonna tread water a bit, you know, uh, kind of a hibernation and, and then, Hopefully by June, July, maybe as late as August, September. I don't know. I don't know. This this whole thing has been uh, very tricky, state by state. Yeah, and that's what I've been talking to people with deep, through deep cuts about just the mm -hmm. challenge that this kind of presents because you know there's certain things that in our industry that you always bank on, like yeah. big events, especially that you can get out there and you can see a whole bunch of people at one time, or you can like go a day early and you know set up meetings and 
And with this, you just don't know what, you, you don't know how it's going to play out. You don't know if there's going to be a summer trade show. You don't know about yeah. cause some of the consumer events. So it's just, right. it's a big challenge. And it's it's hard to kind of, to get, to move forward when you don't know what the, you know, and like you said, every state is, is a completely different situation right now. I know, I know. It, it is strange. It really is. I mean, who would have thunk this? Right? I know. It's like, you know, I was just thinking like, you know, February, I was, everything was normal. And, you know, I was looking at March and I had a couple trips planned and I was like, oh, I was like, let me get ready for these trips. And then all of a sudden I didn't have them. So I was like, oh, <laughs> and then here we are in May. And it's just like, we're still kind of waiting for things to kind of let up. So it's. I'm it's, haunted by, by, it was, I believe March 13th. I'm flying back to Hartford from from phoenix that was my last trip and it's like then everything changed you know, you know what march 13th was the last day that i was out for a yeah. while until like sometime like last like the end of last month because i had a receipt from target and it said march 13th and i was like i think that was the last time i i drove and then last month finally i i, I forced myself to get out just to get an oil change but that was and where are you by the way where are you located I'm in North Carolina, so in the what part Raleigh of Durham Carolina? area. So I live in Durham, but we work in Raleigh. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's funny, yeah. I live in the um, American Tobacco District of mm -hmm. Durham. Yeah. Uh, it's like the most anti tobacco area of, of all of, of all of North Carolina. So all the buildings around here are like former tobacco um, factories and stuff like that that they very converted funny. into warehouses or they I know okay. one's a medical building now. One's a some they have apartment buildings. It's it's really strange, but you can't really smoke anywhere in, in this area, even the sidewalks. They put signs out all of a sudden that says like no smoking on the sidewalks. You're like any like like it's just, it's it's crazy. But that's the kind of the world we live in. Well, and the irony with that and and how it how it uh, plays into the cigar industry, the passion of smoking cigars is the more you legislate, the more you're forcing an exclusivity mindset on the passion of smoking cigars. You're actually, it's actually, oh, the legislation is actually amping up the marketing for, hey, maybe this is for you, you know? Right. Right? <laughs> and you're like, huh, I can't do it. So let me just, I want to find out why I can't do it. Yeah, I mean, it's springing up so many of these wonderful uh, cigar bars and lounges um, all over the country, you know? So as somebody who's worked on not selling cigars and now selling a, a lighter, which one has kind of been the most challenging for you? Um, I would say equally challenging um, if you want to do it right. Um, it is refreshing to be in a, a gadget oriented, you know, uh, product realm, you know, versus cigars. Um, so that, that's been interesting. That was the other thing that kind of lured me in, you know, like, okay, I could still see all my buddies and, you know, still like do my thing. I mean, I could do a lot of these trips blindfolded and I'm, you know, I can just get there. It's second nature. But just having something different, it's it's been refreshing, and I get to learn, you know, learn new things. And you so. talked about having left the industry for a little bit. Like, how did that break? Did that break kind of do you well? Did you kind of like come back a little bit refreshed or with a different perspective? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like my my last ten years have been. Um, you know, I don't even really define it anymore, like a spiritual journey, a metaphysical, blah, blah, blah. I'm basically a, a practicing metaphysician. So I'm very deep into quantum gravity, quantum physics, Sikhism, Taoism, Buddhism, Christian mysticism, Jewish mystic, like all of them. I've, I've, I've reached that point where it's, I see the singularity and the oneness of all of it. And um, so it, it's been uh, a kind of uh, each time I've left the industry, it's been a very monastic kind of um, existence. 
Um, so whatever. That's why I'm I'm just kind of picking out all the positive pearls coming from this nagging Corona thing, you know, new beginnings, you know. Um, in fact, what did I hear the other day? Someone had a term for it too, dream fulfillment. So dream fulfillment is this phenomenon where when something hideous like this occurs, part of you is almost like relieved because it's this excuse to kind of recreate some part of yourself like wow i got off the ride you know even if life was good it was still like okay well again and we do it again and we do it again all of a sudden you know someone sticks a big phillips head screwdriver in your spokes you know and it's like all right you know i gotta get off this ride now what so part of that you know it creates that space to kind of recreate um and whatever that is so i think um there's a lot of positives about what's going on yeah and i found that to be true too and i see a lot of companies um who are just forced to stop and they were forced to kind of change and look at what they were doing to market their, their brands and events that they suddenly had to cancel like how do we go forward from here and i think yeah you know and i i can't really say i've seen any any company stop completely stop like they may have taken a week or two to kind of regroup, but yeah, you know, the whole industry seems to have come back in a, in a kind of a creative way, whether it's opening up their, their businesses to do more stuff like this mm -hmm. or put on their own virtual e events, you yeah. know, virtual hearths. So yeah. I've been glad to see that, that creative thing kind of spark because of all this that happened that really, if, if things had gone on like normal, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be doing this. And I don't think a lot of companies would, have taken the time to like really try to learn about digital um, marketing or social media stuff, or that they would, we would have just been, you know, on this trip, this trip, just doing things business as normal. Right but now uh, it's funny. Cause I've asked a lot of companies, like, do you plan to keep doing what you're doing? Like right now during this time, like in the future, like when we can't have events and they said, you know, and to some degree, probably so right. just, just because it's, it's, this event has been so seismic that it's changed how everybody's reacting and yeah and, you know there's some I mean, good that's come I, out of it i take some of it with me forward you know um yeah i and i probably will you know um because this really isn't so bad i'm having fun here yeah <laughs> and you, you mentioned that that um like the kind of quantum stuff that you're getting into have you mm -hmm. read that book i think it's called quantum success I'm f I'm familiar. I don't think I've read that one, but um, I mean, I, I I'm in the process of, yeah. of reading it. It was one of the books I read that um, the musician Santana. Uh huh. Yeah. He said that he keeps that book like on his nightstand, and he reads right. it religiously. He said it's right. just that that mindset, of, like you said, of, of you know coming out of bad situations or kind of thinking positively, like the power of positive thinking. You know, not accepting negative um mindset so right where thoughts know. go energy flows what you think on grows reflect it back that's what you experience <laughs> right so what you're looking at you're looking with and if that if, the, if that's a thought if i'm you know if i'm massaging a negative thought then the indifference of phenomenon is like oh so you want this okay you know so I got to learn to kind of get over if someone cuts me off in traffic or whatever. And, you know, if, if I hold on to it, it's amazing how just more shitty stuff happens, you know, because I'm ordering it on the menu. Now, now, somebody earlier has said you need to tell us about your lawyer. Yeah, I see uh, Miguel over here. I don't remember that one. I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> Antoine, I'm a lawyer. Yeah, I, I don't I, I don't remember the reference on it. A lot of times I just uh, he's laughing. Yeah, he's laughing. Um, you know, it's a lot of this shtick when I'm riding riding with people and stuff, and it's a lot of just comedy to me. The the state of silliness is that's Buddhism 101 right there. Because when we're silly, the ego doesn't even have to figure out what's funny. It just knows it's something's funny so you like right. the ego can kind of take a nap 
So, but um, I don't know why I'm a lawyer. I'm trying to remember what that shtick was, but there, there's a lot of shtick out there. <laughs> there's a couple of stories I was asked not to share. Oh, yeah, the, uh, it was funny because, you know, I had a lot of people say, oh, Rick's a character. And I was like, well, that's good. That's good for entertainment. <laughs> yeah, use me. <laughs> what, I mean, what's, what's next for Bugatti? What's going on in terms of new releases or gen one and a half we have gen one which what we have right now the uh mirage and the vulcan and then there's gen one and a half which you know you'll have a uh there'll be some modifications i don't want to you know i don't want yuval the ceo to be like uh him joining you know but it's you know holding up a skull and crossbones um, and then there's Gen 2, which we're already working on. A um, lot of talent in this little company, a lot. And a lot of passion in this company. The office, I mean, everybody's involved. Everybody's wearing a lot of hats. Um, a lot of technical talent and natural people talent. So we got to, we got to, see, look, no, you don't. Uh, so, uh, yeah, either way, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good team. It's a really good team. It's solid. So we're just going to keep going, and we're just determined to just really perfect what we're doing, you know, which is impossible. But if, you know, aim, aim for Mars, you land on the moon, you still win, right? Well, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just getting, you know, to the whole thing about lighters is like I've written a story on lighters for um, – tobacco business because for a lot of retailers I don't know if they really pay attention to um you know categories like lighters because mm -hmm. everybody if you have a, a cigar what do you need you need a lighter and especially in this time of, of um being mindful I guess of germs and your own property and who's touched what you probably want your own lighter and you want it to <laughs> you know and and I haven't even you thought about and yeah. you want to invest in a good in a good lighter so like this is like the time i would think in our industry where we're going to be looking at all your personal accessories like lighters and cutters and having your own that's to me that's a big selling point having your own thing where you know it's, it's yours and you've touched it and you don't have to worry about you know other people's germs or spittle or whatever the droplets mean all over. Well, you got me thinking here too. I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I'll, I'll say that Bugatti lighters are the cleanest lighters out there. You're not gonna find a cleaner lighter in both the Mirage and the Vulcan, all color, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, we sent them to laboratories when this thing all went down. No mm -hmm. Corona, not on one lighter. So if, for, since we're almost at the end of our, our hour together, if people want to follow up with Bugatti or they want their own Bugatti lighter. Mm -hmm. Where where can they go? Where should they go? Um, a, please, you know, be aware of your, um, the shops opening in your area or the shop, uh, even if they're doing curbside, go support your local tobacconist, the guy who pays your local taxes and whatnot. Um, we're, they're also, like I said, temporarily available at full retail on our site, BugattiLighters.com. Um, you know, that's that's pretty much what we'll live for right now. And just hopefully, I know little by little, we're, we're seeing orders coming through uh, okay. from the stores. Yeah. And about what price range are these lighters? $99.99. Not bad. No, and $3 for the fuel. And like I said, it's 18 milliliters of butane. It lasts a long, long time. Awesome. Yeah. Well, like I said, if people want to, you talked about Bugatti, they can go to the website to mm -hmm. find more information. If people want to follow you, I know you said you're starting to get into social media a little bit more. Yeah. So if people want to follow you, how can they follow you and, and get in touch? Yeah, well, um, follow um, Bugatti Lighters. Um, um, on Instagram, and then me is Ricky Ardito, R-I-C-K-Y Ardito. Um, I'm on Instagram, and I'm I'm kind of married to it at this point. You know, <laughs> I 
at this point, I'm just kind of doing my reposts and just altering little things, you know, an emoji here, an emoji there. It's like a big deal for me, you know. But, well, Instagram is where it's at. So you're on the right, you're on the right platform, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's enough for me. And then, I'm, you know, Facebook, look for me on Facebook, you know, as well. Rick Ardito. Well, I've had fun talking to you. I probably laughed more in, during this one than I think. So what you were saying about laughter being infectious was, is true. So yes, yes. Um, definitely learned a lot about you, learned a lot about Bugatti. So yep. like I said, hopefully now people who are listening to this now and people who will listen to it in playback will, you know, think about when they're looking to get a lighter next time, they'll think about Bugatti. These lighters right here. I'm selling them right now from my kitchen. <laughs> $89.99. For five minutes, I'm, I'll do it. <laughs> well, like I said, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your Got day. It, Antoine. Thank you. It was, fun. it was fun chatting, and we'll I'm sure we'll follow up because we haven't done an article on you yet for tobacco business. So let's do a hard call. Yeah, I think Whatever we, that we is. need to we need to get that done. Okay. All right. So, have a good rest of your day. Stay safe. Catch that train that you were talking about. <laughs> okay. And I, um, one just went by. <laughs> you need to start running then. Yeah, yeah. And listen, thank you every, for everybody that uh, that plugged in to lit to uh, to watch this little thing. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, like I said, have a good day and stay safe. And I look forward to our next encounter whenever that is. Well, you just let me know. I'm a, I'm available. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. All right, Antoine. Have fun. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.